Firestone actually is. He's been advising Trump for more than three decades. He lobbied for him in the 1990s. He was campaign manager of his aborted 2000 presidential run. Stone was one of the people who strongly urged the president to run for office this time, and he served on the campaign during its critical early months. Trump has fired Stone more than once, maybe a bunch of times, called him a stone-cold loser, but their relationship has always recovered. If anyone can truly claim to understand the president, I think it would be Roger Stone. So he joins us tonight to explain. Roger, thanks for coming on. Thank you, Tucker. So um, what is this fundamentally about? It appears to be, from an outsider's perspective, it appears to be a debate about who can take credit for the unexpected win in 2016. Steve Bannon has taken a lot of credit for that publicly and privately. The president, of course, believes that he did it. To what extent did Bannon contribute to the victory? Well, I wanted to give Steve Bannon the benefit of the doubt, particularly given the reputation of Michael Wolff for fabrication. But now that all the facts appear to be in, uh, and the fact that these comments were made while Steve Bannon was working for the president in the White House, it's a, it's a stunning act of betrayal. Uh, and it's also a complete misunderstanding of Donald Trump. Uh, in Donald Trump's world, in Trump world, there is no Karl Rove. There never has been and there never will be. Donald Trump is very much his own man. He is his own strategist. He is his own phrase maker. He is his own speechwriter. Sometimes he's his own press secretary. He may be the greatest single salesman in American history. Uh, and the president's agenda on which he was uh, elected, I should say his platform, was determined long before Steve Bannon joined the campaign and was determined by one man, Donald Trump. So uh, he's so a phenomena. He's a force of nature, but he cannot be handled or managed. Uh, he's not a puppet and he never will be. So Bannon argues that he put Trump's impulses within a framework that allowed him to win. I, I know Bannon from another life when we ran rival publications. I can't assess his skill as a political strategist or advisor. Is he a political genius in campaigns or no? No, I would, I would actually argue that it's Donald Trump who's the political genius. Uh, here is somebody who overcame enormous odds, massively outspent, uh, with the opposition of the mainstream media, and scores one of the great upset, come-from-behind victories in American political history. Now, the Trump platform was well settled on long before Steve Bannon joined the campaign. And it appears that Stephen Miller helped uh, the president articulate it. But yeah, the agenda is Trump. The drive to win is Trump. The populist campaign is all Donald Trump. Just taking the title of chief strategist is a misnomer uh, at best. So, uh, so the Trump idea was. Uh, is his, go but ahead, the idea talk. was that after the campaign, Bannon was, was kind of the, the living conscience of the White House, the reminder of what the campaign was about um, and a leader of this movement, this conservative movement. Why have so few conservatives publicly defended Steve Bannon in the last 24 hours? He's being attacked. Well, Matt Drudge, Rush Limbaugh both attacked him today. Why is that? Well, first of all, the movement is bigger than any one person. Uh, I asked six people on the way into the Fox studio here who Steve Bannon is, and none of them knew. Every single one of them knew who Donald Trump was, and every one of them knew about his efforts to make America great again. Uh, but then you get to the specifics. No, Donald Trump Jr.'s meeting with a woman Russian lawyer was not treasonous. It was not illegal. It wasn't improper. Steve is neither a lawyer nor an experienced political strategist. That meeting is a nothing burger. Uh, and it looks more and more like a setup to me, given the fact that the Russian woman lawyer was in the country illegally at the sufferance of the Obama administration. So uh, I don't really understand what would motivate Steve to say these things when it's the president who's given him the opportunity for high public service, when it's the president who's given him a White House office. Uh, you could just seem up to anger. Well, but you could chalk it up to anger over being fired if he'd made these comments after he was terminated. But based on my research, he said these things while he was on the Trump payroll. It's, it the sounds that payroll. way. So, fi so finally, why the legal threats? Does the, I mean, I don't think anyone believes the president's going to sue Steve Bannon for violating an NDA or the author of this book. Doesn't this just call attention to the book, help sell books, redound to the benefit of the author of the book? Why would, why would you instruct your lawyers to do something like that? 
Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure about the efficacy of that. I do know this: uh, that the the Trump constituency, the Trump base, will stick with Donald Trump as long as he keeps faith with them on his agenda. The biggest tax cut in American history. Uh, a, a solid conservative on the U.S. Supreme Court, cutting regulations at all levels. Right. That's the Trump agenda. I got to say, the phrase, I don't think I'm not Steve sure Bannon about the efficacy that. of that is my new, it's my new favorite phrase. Roger, it's great to see you. Thanks for coming on tonight. Great to be here, Tucker. Many thanks. Meanwhile, the hits just keep coming for old Lisa Bloom. A report by the New York Times says the liberal super PAC American Bridge for some reason paid Lisa Bloom $200,000 to solicit sexual misconduct allegations against Donald Trump. Huh. Mark Stein is an author and columnist and something of an expert on ethics. He joins us tonight. Is this, I mean, what, I, I don't know if you're a professional ethicist or not. I don't know if you're representing the Bar Association when you say this, but what am I to make of Lisa Bloom taking 200 grand in order to dig up dirt on a political candidate? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I was a professional ethicist, and I'm not sure which bars Lisa Bloom and her mother, uh, Bill, Gloria Allred, uh, belong to. Uh, but there are different incentives at work here. And a lawyer, more than almost any other profession, uh, owes the client uh, honest services. And if you have the setup that uh, these two are engaged in, where they've been fishing, uh, uh, fishing essentially... Uh, for stooges that they can put up uh, as uh, to, to, to damage the president to get the uh, to, so they can be sitting there at press conferences as they've been doing for most of uh, our lives, uh, then I think there is actually something malodorous about it. Well, sure. Uh, I mean, I guess mean, what bothers me, if she were a political consultant or just a conventional slip and fall ambulance chaser, you sort of know what you're getting. But she mm. poses as and is and is represented as by the press as some sort of moral leader who's fighting on behalf of things that are good and true, light against darkness. But she's not. She's a totally cynical, transactional, sleazy lawyer. Well, yes. I mean, you, you mentioned a couple of, of, uh, of weeks ago, Tucker, that she'd, uh, she was originally Harvey Weinstein's lawyer. Exactly. And, uh, then, and then they fell out and she was no longer his lawyer. Now, I, I don't have a problem with that because I actually think it's sometimes helpful, and I've, I've done this myself, uh, to have a, a lawyer who is not uh, on your side ideologically right. uh, and actually just, just looks at the case from the point of the law. And so it's sometimes actually helpful. Uh, it, it might be helpful to have a feminist lawyer actually representing a scummy sleazebag who assaults women. Everybody is entitled to a good defense. What made it sleazy was that she had a book deal with Harvey Weinstein. He was making a television production of her book. That's what that's sleazy. There are ethical rules uh, determining uh, when lawyers embark on business relationships with their clients. And if you look at uh, Lisa Bloom and her mother, for example, one of the reasons they've been trying to raise uh, they're raising money uh, w one of the aspects of this is that uh, if uh, you, uh, if they manage to place an interview with a television network that pays for the interview, the lawyer gets a third of the fee as a commission. Now, that's a lawyer serving as an agent. And exactly. it may well not be in the client's interest, particularly if you're just some uh, ordinary woman who happens to have been sexually assaulted by a powerful man. It may not actually be in your interest to be going on television, becoming a famous person, uh, when in the end uh, Lisa Bloom goes on uh, to the next client and you're living with the consequences of, of having become a briefly famous person, but still with no money or celebrity or enduring fame to show for it. That's so, not I mean, in the client's interest. Right. So she's just a, a parasite like so many uh, lawyers. Yeah. Can, we, can we agree, though, in the end, that I don't have to take any more moral lectures from Lisa Bloom? Oh, no, ab absolutely. I mean, what is interesting to me about this is uh, the, sh she, she is explicitly saying that she wants money to help take down the president. Uh, so you're, you're not giving to a PAC. You're not giving to a cause. You're basically enriching Lisa Bloom uh, to advance her political objectives. And, and, and as I said, the, 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 the particular women in this issue, uh, 
in, in this case are, are just uh, uh, essentially just ventriloquist puppets. Of course. She of course. sticks the hand up the back of the dress and, and makes them say what they say. And, and as I said uh, a couple of minutes ago, for as long as I can remember, I've switched on the TV and Lisa Bloom or her mother has been sitting there next to a woman uh, to whom something bad has happened. And you never hear from the woman again. Uh, and Lisa Bloom and Gloria Allred <laughs> go on to riches and riches exactly. and riches. The only woman Lisa Bloom is helping is Lisa Bloom. Huh, funny. That's Mark right. Stein, great to see you. Thanks a lot, Tucker. Well, the latest wave of emails from Anthony Weiner, remember him, he's in prison now, and his former wife, Huma Abedin's shared laptop, have come out. They've exposed five more classified messages that should not legally have been there. We now know of 18 of those that were on the laptop. Tom Fitton is the president of Judicial Watch, which secured the release of these emails, and he joins us tonight with an update. Tom, um, how hard was it to get these? Oh, it only took two years. Uh, <laughs> it took two years. <laughs> federal lawsuit. Uh, the FBI found these records last year, back in October, when uh, James Comey famously announced that at a press conference there were other documents on the Wiener laptop. Were these documents the personal property of whom at Ab Aberdeen and Anthony Wiener, or were they government property which belongs to us? Yeah, they were FBI. Re the FBI determined they were government records, and they right. were turned over to the State Department, who took forever. So why did you have to wait two years and sue to get them? Well, because we found out about Clinton's email server back in 2015. We knew Yuma Abedin had an email account on that server. We asked for he, her emails, and they eventually found some of more addition, uh, additional emails on the Wiener laptop that were government records. And again, these are classified records that James Comey and his uh, colleagues at the FBI knew were on the Wiener laptop, but didn't think serious enough to pursue criminal charges against Abedin or Clinton for allowing this egregious abuse of uh, uh, their trust that the American people place in them in terms of securing classified information to be abused. So since you've been in Washington a long time and followed cases like this for a long time, give us some perspective. If you had the, this many classified documents on your laptop, what would the consequences be? Well, you'd, be, you'd lose your security clearance almost initially, and you'd be subject to a criminal investigation and perhaps a prosecution. And it wasn't just the low-level classified materials that were found in the Clinton email server, but they were highly uh, top-secret documents uh, of the most secure of the most secure type, and it would have resulted in criminal prosecution. I guarantee you, if you were anyone else but the Democratic nominee for the president, you know there are four and a half million people last I checked with security clearances. They all know this is a scam the way that Hillary Clinton and Abedin have been protected. And this is why it's interesting to see the Justice Department, as reported today, is actually re-looking at this issue finally. So the pressure's working, Tucker. The Justice Department is going to go back and ask at least some questions about how this, uh, the Comey, Lynch, Justice Department, and FBI handled this last year about the classified information, how that was handled, the decision not to prosecute, and things like that. And it's well past time that that take place. So a system that crushes ordinary people protects the powerful and well-connected. That's right. And right now we are fighting this Justice Department, this State Department, the Director of National Intelligence over whether they're even going to do a, a damage assessment over having classified material, as I say, on the Internet equivalent of a public park bench. Unbelievable. Thank you. Tom Fitton, You're welcome to see you. Well, Keith Ellison, who's a congressman from Minnesota, but also the deputy chairman of the DNC, just endorsed a book that promotes vigilante violence in Antifa. Minnesota isn't some obscure C-list Democrat. He is deputy chair of the Democratic National Committee. He nearly won the chairmanship outright last year. He's a champion still of the party's progressive wing. He's a great favorite of the grassroots. He deserves to be regarded as one of the Democratic Party's top thought leaders, such as they are. Yesterday, Ellison tweeted this, quote, at Moon Palace Books, and I just found the book that will strike fear in the heart of Donald Trump. And the book Ellison was talking about is called Antifa, the Anti-Fascist Handbook. Why would that book strike fear into the heart of the President of the United States? Well, maybe because that book advocates for political violence against people like Donald Trump and his supporters. The author is a man named Mark Bray, and he writes that violence is, quote, a small, though vital, sliver of anti-fascist activity. Elsewhere in the text, he approvingly quotes an Antifa activist who says this of his political opponents. Quote, you fight them with fists so you don't have to fight them with knives. 
You fight them with knives so you don't have to fight them with guns. You fight them with guns so you don't have to fight them with tanks. Well, it's about as explicit a justification for political violence as there is. Bray also in the book, by the way, attacks freedom of speech. He endorses the tactic of silencing those he disagrees with. Now, of course, Bray claims to fight fascism, but he is himself a fascist. Keith Ellison believes Bray's work is admirable. He said so. Now, if you're shocked by this, you haven't followed Ellison's career for very long. He has a long history of saying repugnant things and backing extremist causes. Back in 1989, Ellison wrote that the Constitution existed only for white people. He referred to it as, quote, their Constitution, calling it, quote, the best evidence of a white racist conspiracy to subjugate other peoples. That's the Constitution of the United States. Ellison has spoken favorably, meanwhile, of cop killer Assata Shakur. He said he was, quote, praying that Fidel Castro's communist regime in Cuba would not be forced to extradite her back to the United States. As a law student at the University of Minnesota, Ellison wrote a column calling for the creation of a separate black ethnostate. This is the man who is now second in command of the entire Democratic Party. Now, that ought to bother Republicans and independents. It should terrify Democrats. Most voters don't support cop killing, racial separatism, political violence, abolishing freedom of speech, and they tend to flee from politicians and parties that do support those things. Democrats at this point assume they're going to make major gains in this year's midterm elections purely on the strength of the president's low poll numbers. So at this point, they're happy to ignore haters like Keith Ellison. Ellison opposes Trump, and that's enough for now. But what would happen if Democrats actually did win and got power back in November? Suddenly, Ellison's views would matter a lot. He and people like him would have real control over your life. Are you ready for that? Keith Ellison's personal radicalism fits into another really troubling trend on the left that has massive implications for the country and for you. Last time we talked to journalist Chadwick Moore about how on the left, in the name of fighting racism, it is now common to attack people on the basis of their race. If you want to see racism everywhere, if you're brainwashed to see racism everywhere, or homophobia everywhere, or whatever, then you will. That's the world you will live in. You know, I was having a conversation with, uh, with a woman uh, not too long ago about this, a, a young upper middle class black woman. And she was talking about how badly she you know, gets treated on the street here in New York. And I said to her, what if you lived for one day as a white woman and you were treated the exact same way? Monique Presley is a lawyer and a Democratic commentator, and she joins us now. Monique, great to see you. Good to see you. Totally opposed to, I think, I'm 48, I grew up in a country where you had to be, and most people I knew were, totally opposed to attacking other people on the basis of the race because you can't control your race, right? You're not responsible for it. You're saying you grew up in a country where most I, people... I grew, I grew, that's where I grew up. That, that, everyone said that at school. Most people I knew said they believed that. Maybe they didn't, but you kind of had to say that, and I believed it. I still believe it. Mm -hmm. Now I live in a world where the left still says that, and yet they do it and somehow exempt themselves from the normal rules. So you're racist, but when I attack you on the basis of your race, I'm not racist, I'm virtuous. How does that work? That seems insane to me. I don't know how we end up in this kind of warped world where I end up doing the history lesson of history I know you know. But when you're saying you grew up in a world where people knew it was wrong to attack others on the basis of race, I'm wondering if you were in the United States of America. I was. It's I was in Ohio, California. Look, that from, don't, don't from rewrite the history that so I grew I'm, up I'm in. not rewriting I'm just telling the history. You, that's I'm what I was taught and I believe. Of our country. And you should believe that, and that's a good belief. But if you grew up in the United States of America, then you know that not just just people's belief systems, but codified laws, right, discriminated against people expressly because of their race. I'm That's fully those are the no, facts of the country it. we I'm live fully in. aware of that. Okay. But I'm 48. I'm not 78. That didn't exist where I grew up. I'm just telling you, this is right. just true. But the point is, I believed it. I still believe it. Why don't you believe it? But we're just a year apart. And if you're saying because you're 48, not 78, are you saying that segregation, which really didn't formally end until we were already born? It gets born. wrong to attack people on the basis of the race. That's all I'm saying. It, it and, absolutely and, okay, is. Okay, then why, so why does the if, left do it? And so That's if the question. people of color have been attacked because of their race, not for decades, but for generations, I agree. then it's... 
it's really reasonable to expect that they would take issue with that and with those who have done it for generations. And I think and that attack that is some them of on the basis of their race. Now, I mean, I'm missing never, this. There should never be physical attacks of anyone, no, uh, uh, and there shouldn't be emotional or verbal no, attacks. How about, of anyone. how about just how about just criticizing people on the basis of their race? You can't control. It's not a choice that you made. You shouldn't ever hold someone's race against him. Because it's not his fault. That's the whole point. That's why racism is wrong, right? That is exactly why racism is exactly. wrong. So why is so the left the, doing that so, now? And I don't know, you know, when you say the left, I wonder who those people are. I don't know. Every time, I, every time I pull up BuzzFeed or Huffington Post <laughs> or any lefty site, there's some piece about white people or a scourge on America. They're bad. It's like, I'm not defending white people. All I'm saying is you shouldn't write off any group of people on the basis of their race. I thought that was the definition of racism, and, and now it's very common. And I, ha frankly, haven't read any articles that say white people are this or white people are that are just on the basis of their race. If you are white and you are also a bigot, if you are white and you are also a racist, then I've read many things that discuss a lack of understanding in this country. You haven't heard anybody say the in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. too many white guys. Guys. It's just a white guy thing. You haven't seen any peak. No, I'm serious. Too many white guys wear Tucker. A anywhere. You haven't okay. seen anyone really. I, I, so my question to you is, no, are you living I mean, in this and country? That, and that really wouldn't make sense for the past 10 years since the numbers of white males are decreasing in our country and the numbers of Latinos, African Americans, etc. are increasing. So I guess so here's, I here's, have here's, heard people talking about that balance and how that can be scary for those who are I'm used saying, to being in power. Look, uh, don't patronize me. I'm, I'm merely I'm making a point that can we agree that it's always wrong, always, no matter who's doing it to whom, to dismiss people, attack them, judge them, on the basis of immutable characteristics, racial characteristics, that they can't control, period. Yes. Amen. Absolutely. So then would and you... those racial characteristics really are just skin. Remember, race is a construct. It's a legal and social construct then why, in the United States. Then that's kind of the case I'm making that we agree. origin are different Then altogether. why would you ever give preference in hiring or college admissions to someone solely on the basis of something he couldn't control. Isn't that the definition because, of racism? Because of what we just finished talking about. But you just agreed it was so wrong. If, so if so why do you I said it, it was wrong to attack on the basis of race, I didn't say it was wrong to help on the basis no, of race. No, got. let's say you have one right. job and two people, mm -hmm. and you make the decision, the deciding factor is the race of one of the people. One person is being hurt because he's the wrong race. Why would why is that okay? Because he's gotten three hundred and fifty, maybe four hundred years of benefit. He for has the ha right. Do you race. know him? Okay. Are you just so, gently? So so do United you know States, that all you know about him is his race, and exactly. yet you're saying that he's benefited. Exactly. And you but you don't know anything about him other than his race. So you're saying that all people of a certain color have something in common, which is Kind of the definition of racism, isn't it? No, that's also oh, the definition of discrimination because oh. all African American people in the United States have something in common. It's that they were discriminated but against. But if someone, if but, it's but you don't know anything about the, 50s, the guy, they have something have in common in that they he were subject up to from lynching. Belgium yesterday. He could have. He has no connection right. to it. But you think it's okay to deny him something because of his color. I think that the system itself, in order to fix what is the one original oh, sin of this country, has to correct itself. So we need more racism has to, to fix racism. Itself. I don't consider that racism at all. Oh, it's not racism. All. When you do it, it's not if, racism. If I, I am it. in power totally as an African-American woman, and I insist upon you walking around with one hand tied behind your back, uh -huh. but I want you to plow no, a no, field, no, no, I'm not, then I'm talking about the guy not, from, wait, no, 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 I'm talking about the guy from Belgium who didn't do anything, who's not connected in any can, way. Can we go He's, to my no, analogy, no, at least serious. to the finish he of suffers, it. suffers, an individual suffers, yes. but you don't consider that racism okay. because no. why? No, it's not. Because oh. the numbers of people in this country who have been disproportionately discriminated against for hundreds of years are such that there has to be a correction for it. So some there people have to, to suffer correction. on the basis of and their race. And in this country, those people have been African Americans okay. and other people So the guy who's done nothing wrong must suffer because 
other people who looked like him did something yes, wrong. Yes, be because I, I, I as an African American woman, yes, I okay. absolutely I you're call never it in justice. You're worrying. Well, I'm That's... in charge now of something because I'm here, right? Yeah, that sounds like collective punishment to right. me. Well, you're probably an innocent party too, Tucker. But here you are know. with this show, and there probably are a number of similarly situated, talented African American males who could do just as good a job or better than maybe, you. Maybe you so. may be getting the benefit of your race. Do you think so? Because if that's the only difference I think, between you I think and you, another talented really journalist. I don't think that you should punish people for things they didn't do. I agree. For things they're not responsible for. You I just agree. argued that you should. But you should so advance. You just argued that you should. It's not punishment. It's, I, not, oh, it's not punishment. Oh, no, okay. It's not. This it's is Orwellian. advancement. We're out of time. Mm -hmm. It's not punishment. <laughs> it's not punishment. I love that. Happy New Year, People Tucker. People like not getting jobs. Good to see you. Thank Good you. Good to money. see you, too. Well, robots and artificial intelligence could be devastating for low-skill work in this country. They're going to be, according to all forecasts. And yet economic elites continue to demand more low-skilled workers come into the country. Why are they doing that? Rendering low-skilled jobs obsolete at a frightening pace. We've been talking about this for a couple of years, but it seems to be picking up momentum in a kind of scary way. A November report by McKinsey Global Institute estimated self-driving cars, robots, and artificial intelligence could eliminate up to 73 million jobs in this country by 2030, which is not that far from now. Despite this, the bulk of America's political and economic elite are continuing to demand, for some reason, more low-skilled immigration into the U.S. 1.8 million immigrants entered this country last year, 2016. Actually, that was the biggest figure in American history. Most of them were low-skilled workers. Why is that? Javier Palomares, CEO of the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and he joins us tonight. Javier, thanks for coming on. How are you, Tucker? Thanks so for having me. I took a friend me. of the doctor yesterday, the surgeon and the head nurse were both immigrants. They were mm -hmm. both superior, impressive, and great people, and they mm -hmm. did a great job. Mm -hmm. And it was a reminder that a lot of immigrants are great, mm -hmm. but they're not all the same. Mm -hmm. And you gotta kinda wonder at a time when tradition, the jobs that immigrants have traditionally done are going away mm -hmm. at a really rapid clip, why are we not adjusting our immigration policy accordingly? Well, you know, I think we shouldn't conflate two separate things here. There's immigration policy, which obviously needs to get looked at and needs to be fixed. But let's look at the facts. Right now, we are at about a 4% unemployment rate. That's near perfection. What that tells us is that, in fact, there aren't a bunch of people walking around without a job. And what we're hearing from our clients, from the technology Wait, are you, sector, are you being serious? Absolutely, like to from the technology sector, from the, the technology force. sector to manufacturing to skilled labor to agriculture, every one of our clients have more jobs than they have people to fill okay, those okay. jobs. But let's—I mean, the trend is really clear: low-skilled jobs are going away at a faster rate than any other kind of job. So why wouldn't we say stop? We want talented immigrants, but we want people who can fill the jobs, not just of the distance future, but like of the next decade. And those are not low skilled jobs. And yet the people who are coming in are overwhelmingly low educated people, low skilled people, maybe great people. A lot of them probably are. But that's not a good picture at all. Why are we doing that? Tucker, I just spent four days on the West Coast talking to the uh, the, the the California Strawberry Growers Association two days in Florida talking to the Florida Growers Association. In both cases, on both sides of the country, low-skilled labor, they do not have enough people to oh, pick on. the crops Strawberry that are picking, really? I mean, Absolutely. look, I'm not again, I have all family way, in agriculture, but that, let's be real. All the way to the most technically, is not the future, okay? No, all the I'm way to serious. the most technically advanced jobs okay, in this nation. We are at, actually at 4% unemployment, my friend. But that's not a real number, as you well know, and it doesn't, look, it doesn't change the fact mm -hmm. that we're importing people who are overwhelmingly mm -hmm. less skilled than our native population. Mm -hmm. Look at the DACA recipients. We're always hearing about, oh, they're all in the military or class president. Some of them are. Mm -hmm. But for every DACA recipient in the military, mm -hmm. two have been found to be in a gang. Mm -hmm. They are graduating high school at a much lower rate than Americans, going to college at a much lower rate than Americans. Doesn't mean they're bad people. Here are the facts but around why DACA. Why are we doing this? Here are the facts around DACA. 
The DACA recipients right now have a 91% employment rate, which is, by the way, better than their native-born counterparts. They are That's heavily vetted the before I'm they come into this country. They are, in, they are basically disqualified from any kind of federal funding or grants of any sort when they are a DACA recipient. They are paying over $2 billion in what's, state what's and local common, taxes every year. What's the year. most common occupation for a DACA recipient? It no. runs the gamut. No, the they most are common. In the military. Do you know the most common one? What is it? Food preparation. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And that's one of the sectors that is being automated. Have you been to McDonald's recently? Yeah, absolutely. Look, so my point is, why don't we have a system that gives overwhelming preference to, say, engineers, people who write code, mm -hmm. and not preference to the relatives of people who are already here? I don't understand. A normal country would do that. Why don't we? <laughs> the reality of it is, Tucker, again, we need help on every, every conceivable business model in this country right now needs skilled labor. And it runs the gamut. Then again, why are the majority the of immigrants the unskilled labor? Because those are the people that are coming to this country. And but the why reality don't we of it decide is, who's coming to this country? Why do we say we want to give preference to people who can really help our economy? Why aren't we doing that? It, it is the same as saying that the people who are coming and doing those jobs are, in fact, not helping the economy. And, in fact, they are helping the Look, economy. I'm not attacking them. I'm really not attacking no, them I understand in that. any way. I and I understand why they want to come here. Yeah, yeah. It just seems like we are doing the bidding of employers that want to have their strawberries picked cheaper. And the long-term effect is really bad on the country. The rest of us are going to pay the co cost of that. No, Why are we going along with he, this? Here's the, here's the sad reality of it is, when you talk to these individuals in the agricultural sector, they will tell you that they have tried to offer these jobs to navy board Americans at any price, and uh -huh. they cannot fill All those right. jobs. Pay me 30 bucks, I'll pick strawberries. <laughs> Javier, it's great to see you. Thank you for Thanks that. Thanks for having me, Tucker. Take care. More than 100,000 homeless people live in the state of California. It's more than live in the city of... Homelessness is exploding in the state of California, particularly in the cities. And if you've been there recently, you know what we're talking about. According to HUD here in Washington, 114,000 homeless people reside in that state. That's a quarter of the national total. Bill Wells is the mayor of El Cajon, California, near San Diego. He said that rather than fighting homelessness, lawmakers in his state are actively promoting homelessness. Well, panhandling in 10 cities enjoy legal protection. He says the homeless have learned they can commit petty crimes with impunity which is shocking to hear. Mayor Wells joins us tonight. Mr. Mayor, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Tucker. It sounds so perverse, it's hard to believe. The state of California, you say, is encouraging homelessness. How? Well, there's been a legislative philosophy that is really encouraging normalizing homelessness. And we've seen several uh, laws that have come by, AB 109, reclassified 70 crimes from serious to non-serious. And the result of that was about 8,000 people were released from the prisons. And a thousand of those people ended up on the streets. We know that about 10 percent of all homeless populations are former prisoners. And that's just one of the many laws. 10 percent of all homeless in the state of California are recently released prisoners? Yeah, you know, it's true. You know, I, I should point out that besides being the mayor of the city, I'm also a mental health professional. I've done this kind of work for about 30 years. I have a doctorate in psychology and I work in an inner city ER. And I can tell you that most of the homeless people that I run across um, are involved in drugs and alcohol, and right. a lot of the new laws have a lot to do with that. Uh, for example, Proposition 47 reclassified many of the felonies, and uh, SB, uh, Senate Bill 180 made it very difficult to send people back to prison who are involved in drugs and alcohol. And a lot of the homeless advocates very much want to ignore anything that has to do with hinting that some of the homeless people have drug and alcohol problems when if you ask any police officer or ER doctor, we know it's probably a 90 percent or above of people in the homeless population are drug or alcohol. But, but why? Yeah, and it's obvious when you're there. But why would officials want to lie about something like that? Well, I think that homeless advocates really are trying to protect the system in which they, they give away uh, money v through various programs. And they feel that if people feel that the, the people that are getting these benefits are drug addicts or alcoholics, they'll right, somehow not it. qualify for right. these programs. But what about the people who aren't homeless, but who aren't rich and just you live in a neighborhood, you're excited to buy the house and all of a sudden you got a lot of people living on your street. What does it do to their quality of life? Well, it's been terrible for the people of, of my city. <clears throat> We've seen about a 35% increase in homelessness in El Cajon, but in the beach cities, I know you're from the beach area, yeah. uh, we've seen over 